You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. We are live. Tyler, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Um, You know, we are at that time of year again. We got springtime. The birds are chirping. The dogwoods are starting to bloom. Uh, the dirty thirty broke at Lake Anna. I think the last time we talked, like we were actually like taught, like will it be broken in the next five years? And two months later, it breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was crazy. Like I, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming, especially that that time of year with those guys that went out there, but. You know, I haven't noticed any, like, I thought after that, the traffic was going to be, like, crazy on the lake, but it just seems normal to me. But, like, I think, if anything, it gives people a lot more, like, that hope. Like, sometimes you need something to go to a lake. Like, when people are cracking a 30-pound bag, and it's just one so far that's documented, um, you know, that's a good sign. Now, it's it's an absolutely insanely good sign. Like, and, and so, I guess, well, what have you been up to the past couple of months? Oh man. So the past couple of months, starting in February, I, you know, I got, you know, I got the boat ready, got everything ready and started getting out on the, uh, on the lake. Um, you know, the, the beginning part of, of kind of spring or February, we kind of had like this weird warm front, like abnormally weird February weather. Um, but the fish, you know, they, they weren't really there, you know, it was still typical winter type of patterns. I thought it did definitely speed things up a bit. And then like, we come into March and like we had this this like nasty cold front and I'm like, okay, so everything that was pushing it up is kind of just leveling. So we're kind of seeing like a typical Anna like spawn. I don't think it's going to be too far ahead, maybe slightly, but it's going to be kind of right on par, like with when you're expecting that first big wave of, of fish to move up. But yeah, man, I've just been, you know, I've been out there just fishing, fishing, graphing, learning, figuring a few things out, catching a few, but but yeah, no, it's definitely right now is an exciting time to be to be out on Anna. I mean, everything is about to to start popping off. What is a typical Lake Anna spawn? So from my experience, a typical Lake Anna spawn um, will pro- you know, you're going to start seeing seeing the males about this time um, in, in March. You're going to see them moving up and doing their, their kind of thing. And the females are moving into their staging areas. But, you know, there is since there is a warm water discharge uh, over on in Dyke 3, you will see you will see some spawners earlier, I think, than people expect. Uh, but not that big wave that's all throughout the lake. That still is like your typical mid-April. You know, all of this is weather is weather uh, dependent and like, you know, water temperature dependent. Um, but I think you, you really start seeing fish from like the middle of April all the way through all the way through May, you will, you will for sure still see even late May, you will find a few on bed, but the majority is like that mid April to mid May. Um, you know, I'd say that's kind of typical for lakes and uh, around, you know, this area. So then if we go guys, and I know I had three people this week and thank you for commenting. Cause I read all the comments, sadly, um, you wanted more map work. And so I'm going to try to add more of that. So for the people that are new that are from Northern Virginia, Ashburn area, the, the dikes are you have dike one which is up here sorry dyslexic as hell so <laughs> dike one is up near the nuclear power plant which separates the cold water side from the warm water side or what i like to call the rich people versus the normal people <laughs> uh and then as you go down you have dike two and then you have dike three and so what tyler's talking about is dike three is down by the dam right here yeah and yeah so you'll get so actually Lake Anna is pretty unique and this is just something to keep in mind. I wouldn't like go out there and base a whole trip on it, but your dam area is typically your warmest water area, which is a little bit can, that can kind of confuse people because uh, you know, there is that warm water discharge and stuff that goes in. So your dam area is typically the warmest. Your midsection is typically the coldest. This can kind of depend and your upper section is, you know, typically in between the two but it also because there's less surface and water area it's going to respond to to cooling trends or warming trends more so so it's kind of a weird little thing it's like it doesn't really make sense other than you know just from right your dam is your warmest your midsection is usually your coolest and then your upper area is kind of in between the two 
I'm going to switch back to Google Earth here. So um, if we break this lake down into part to to parts, I can speak, mm-hmm. guys. I'm sorry. Um, starting at the dam, what what kind of water temperatures are you seeing? And then you know it is the mm-hmm. first week of April right now, guys. When when this is being released, so what kind of water temperatures are you seeing down lake yeah. right near? Yeah, so right near the dam, uh, when I was there a week ago, like literally like on the dam, I mean, because of you're getting kind of like that like three and that, you know, that discharge, um, uh, seeing like upper 50s, um, upper 50s, I wouldn't be surprised literally like as we're speaking, you're probably getting a surface temperature of, of, of 60 and probably a consistent 60 looking at the weather uh, for the next 10 days. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if there's not fish already on beds right there, um, I haven't seen it, to, but I know Valentine Cove, which is actually that cove that your mouse is just by, right by the dam, uh, other way. Uh, yeah, other direction, my bad. Um, north right of here. that. No, 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 other side Hold of on. the dam. Yeah, other Not side right of the dam. Yeah, Valentine Cove. Um, that is actually kind of known to get, um, historically, you'll see some of your first kind of like spawners and in, in there. Um, but... Yeah, you have to understand that this part of the lake is deeper. So as far as seeing them sometimes, it is the clearest, but it is deeper. So, you know, it, you're not going to, it's hard to see them sometimes, but that is, that is a, a definitely a big, big spawning cove. You know, that's no secret, but if you didn't know, now, you know, that's a good place um, try to, to try to see some, uh, get ahead of fish actually, and get on some, some bedding fish. There's actually a lot of lay downs here too. I didn't realize this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of stuff to stage on in there. What is the what is the water levels like? Is it actually at full pool or is it a little below right now? It's like at full. Yeah, I mean honestly, it, it for me when I really started fishing it hard for the past like year and a half now, two years, like I fish it my whole life and it's never fluctuated too much. I think there was like one year where I remember it being lower when I was there for an event, but. You know, it's pretty pretty consistent lake levels. I don't ever see it drop too much or enough to really change like your approach. Interesting. Okay. And then guys, here's a little like pro tip. Um, I, I just been screwing around with Google Earth Pro. And so when he said that it's at normal lake levels, the, the newest version of the map on Google Earth, it was actually in October of 2021 and the lake level was down. So by him mm-hmm. saying it's it's up to normal pool, I just moved it back to 2020 in may and i can see that it's completely at full pool so now we can yeah. have a better illustration of what it's like now it's actually free google earth pro download it it's actually a neat little app to kind of like help you guys out but anyway so that's like the lower end of the lake and then primarily what kind of forge are you dealing with at this part of the lake yeah so this part of the lake i mean you're dealing with your typical stuff I mean, we can talk about the herring but i don't ever want to like in my personal experience i don't like to get people too excited about chasing a herring bite out here because you're just going to burn yourself out. Um, so just think like thread fin, think crawfish, think bluegill, think those sort of things. There is herring there, but it, it, my approach has always been if the herring come to me more so, you know, obviously if I see them breaking on a point, I'm going to go over there, but I, I, that's something that I always have taken as a bonus. I, I don't think there's enough in there right now are there the fish haven't really adjusted to become true? There is some to become like true, you know, just herring chasers, just just nonstop. And this time of year in the spring, you're coming up on a time where that herring bite kind of dies out because the fish are moving up to the banks mm-hmm. and the herring herring will get get shallow. Um, not to say that doesn't mean if you want to match the hatch. I mean, it, I throw herring colored bait. I mean, like a lot of the big fish I've caught on swim baits this year have all been blue back herring swim baits, like a five inch swim bait in herring color. So it's not like I'm, I still acknowledge that they're there, but I'm not actively looking for that herring thing. So it seems to be where I tend to fish. It's, it's a higher possibility that these herring are going to come to me or around me where I can see them on side scan or on 2d and then I can kind of go from there. And a lot of time, I mean, when you get on that, I mean, it's on. It, it's quick, but it, it's on. And you can, so it's just something to, to keep in the back of your mind. But I would not go there and go, oh, I'm going to chase a herring bite. There might be some guys that can do that effectively. But if you're coming to this lake for the first time and you're not from a herring lake, I, I, I would avoid that. But I would keep it in mind and adjust your, the baits, colors you're using. And just know in the back of your mind, it's a possibility. Yeah, because like, and, and usually, 
um, from my experience, the blueback is really big. You know, in the winter time is the primary primary time when those blueback really like pull up in big pods in the guts of creeks. And then again, you'll have it in the the the, the late spring to early summer time when they start spawning. And mm-hmm. they'll throw themselves onto big clay points. But again, that was like when I was fishing like Lake Murray and Hartwell and stuff for the, for the championships. Um, and I, yeah, it's it's not just you that's saying that. Like the herring are there, but they're not like at Kerr or, or Smith Mountain Lake where there's a lot of them, a lot more of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just going to be interesting like how that will change how the lake fishes if it becomes more prevalent in, in future years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, you know... Like I said, though, like I've gotten on, <laughs> I mean, I, I got on like a stupid bite earlier and it wasn't because I was in somewhere where the herring would probably be, but I wasn't actively looking for them. I was, I was really just looking for fish that were making like that first kind of move from like the main channel kind of deal. And then all of a sudden the herring are just like, I see like, they're just going crazy. And I mean, like one of them, it's like still cold. Like we're talking like 50 degree, 52 degree water and like, they're even like coming to the surface and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> and then it's just like one of those things to, to have, have in the back of your mind. So now as we move back up the lake and then actually, what would you consider the mid lake section of Lake Anna? Like where, where does mid lake start? Because what's yeah. interesting, um, if you look online and they say the size of the lake, I don't think it takes into consideration that one side of the lake is private. And I could be wrong. That dawned on me before uh, we we started talking today. Is I I'm very curious, and maybe you guys let me know in the episode description. When they say the lake is like nine or whatever, how many acres are they including the whole lake? Because if that's the case, this lake is a lot smaller than nine, and that really cuts down what I would consider you know lower, middle, upper. Yeah, yeah. For me, it. It usually, I would consider the lower end, and this is all subjective. It's really just yeah. the way that I go out and tackle it. Is I would say from Sturgeon Creek down to the dam, not including really Sturgeon. Sturgeon, I mean, it's, it's that's kind of like its own little thing. That's that Sturgeon Creek is almost like its its own little deal. I would go from that down to the dam, and I consider that like you know that lower section of of the lake, and then I consider from Sturgeon to the splits, the midsection. And then up both of the split arms would be the upper lake. Interesting. Why, why is your middle section so small? So my middle section is so small because it just is an easier way personally for me to kind of attack the lake. And it also does have to do with some of the water temperature trends that I see. When you start getting into that more skinnier water on the splits, the one that, you know, when it splits like right up there, um, you know, the water temperature trends are, it's usually a slightly different kind of like right when you get through like that first initial bridge or whatever, that to me, fish is different. It just has, when I run up there, it just fishes different. It fishes more traditional. There is more like kind of a bank beating type pattern. Um, you can still find some stuff that drags out, but you know, it, it everything's just tighter and it just, it just feels different. And then that midsection, it, it almost feels like this nice, combination between the upper and the lower and the fish there are are a little are a little weird i say it's like they don't really know what they want to do you can you have that like dock pattern that shallow pattern but then you do also have some points and some and some main like like brush and some other stuff that runs out there and then that lower end you really have like this true uh lowland reservoir bite with islands everywhere and points that drag out and shoals so for me that's just kind of how i break it down that's interesting. That's really interesting. And like, and, and I just to make sure um, I'm on the same page. So you said the upper end starts at the break of the uh, of the split, or at the two, the first two bridges. Yeah, I would kind of consider like those bridges with to to like almost down all the way down to Sturgeon Creek as like midsection in my mind. Gotcha. Okay, so from these bridges to to Sturgeon. Gotcha. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then it splits up here. Interesting. And then all of that stuff up there where like it almost kind of feels like it feels like you're fishing like almost a river or a big creek kind of deal. Just everything's tighter. Um, you know, you got some grass and stuff up there, a lot of dock. Um, the water is certainly dirtier. I mean, usually a lot dirtier. It it really is. Let's see, where the heck is it? Because I know up is it right here. Yeah, I mean, like this area right in here is absolutely 
fantastic with aquatic vegetation in mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. And then what is the, does the forage change as you go up like? So I've never run into herring other than uh, that lower section that I'm talking about, the area that's somewhat between sturgeon and the mm -hmm. dam. So I think it is like your more typical, you know, bluegill, uh, you know, crawfish, shad, like thread fins and stuff. I think it is like the fish are more keyed in on that sort of thing. Are there any gizzard chat? That's a good question. I have never seen a gizzard chat. I think, I don't know if they're in there. That's actually a good question. I have never seen gizzard chat out there. Like, like never, even during like a, like a little shad kill or something with the temperature change or I've never heard about gizzard being a player. They could be. And I just don't know. I'm going to have to ask Owen Kirk about that and reach out to him because that'd be interesting to know if there's big like a uh, burrito burrito whatever the bullshit yeah the bur yeah. bullshit burrito yeah if, if something like that would actually play play but then again you said like the blueback herring color is is usually your go-to correct yeah and that on that lower end for sure i mean that's what I'm, I'm if i'm throwing like a swim bait or even even a jerk bait like i'll kind of mix it between just like your traditional like american thread fin or something shad color or blueback um and that's not to say that that won't work up here because, again, I'm not like a big stickler on color. There's situations where I think it works, but, you know, at the same thing, I think it's there's other things that go into other than just color. So then what are your top baits in this time of year? Or yeah. your top categories or genres? Yeah, so my top baits for this kind time of year – like if we're talking pre-spawn, I mean, I'm, I just, I lock a jerk bait in my hand sometimes so much that like my wrist hurts. Um, just cause <laughs> I like, yeah, like it's bad. Like I, sometimes I just can't put it down. Um, I like throwing, throwing moving baits in the pre-spawn. I like trying to find active fish. Um, I do definitely, I, I am, I consider myself more of uh, like looking for an offshore, that mid range bite. I've never, truly beaten the bank. So I'm usually fishing something like a drop shot or something. Um, and that pre-spawn in the water is still cold, drop shot, jerk bait, crank baits if the conditions are right. You know, the spinner bait bite on Anna can get real good. Um, you know, staple at Anna is a scrounger, uh, scrounger head with like a little, you know, swim bait or fluke type bait on the back of it. Um, so th anything that's covering water is the pre-spawn. And then when it comes into the spawn and they're getting shallow, I mean, I don't, there's nothing, you know, there's a few things maybe that, that I think I'm a little sneaky with, but, you know, I wouldn't get too worried about, I think it's more about finding the areas the fish are going to be and then bait secondary. Um, but if it comes to baits, you know, even something like, a, I like the Berkeley general out there, uh, well, you know, when they really are starting to get to the bank or, you know, say you need like that, that last keeper, a shaky head is another staple on Anna. I mean, just that, like an absolute staple and all like you know all the guys that have a really long history out there you've probably won a lot of money on a shaky head um flipping baits uh you know different texas rig plastic like i mean there's a, you can it's so wide open that's what's like the fun part of this year like i think it's just so wide open for starting now really i mean like the second we're recording this through may I, it, this lake becomes super fun because you don't really need to have like the juice or that one like secret bait to go out there and catch them. Whereas in some of the other months, you might really need to dial in your approach. But, um, but yeah, man, I, another one, a great one. This is a little, people do not believe me. So I am not lying to you. And I will, and within the next month, if you look at my Instagram page, I will provide video proof of this. If you throw a methylite floating worm on Lake Anna, you will 110% from mid lake. I haven't used all the way upper from mid lake to lower. You will catch them. A methylite, that ugly hot Cheeto colored worm. You will catch. You're them. kidding. No, I'm not at all. I won. We did a little, just like with some random guys. I knew that were coming through the area. We did a little after work jackpot tournament and it was just like, you could fish with a buddy or you fish by yourself. And I was like, I'm bringing out the floating worm. Like, I'm just going to go have fun today. And I picked up this methylate worm, something I've actually caught him on, on the Potomac. That's where I did it. And you can get them in that stage. Uh, it's really good when you have some fish on bed and you also have post-spawn fish. It's good when you have a, a mix of spawn and post-spawn still. Um, 
And yeah, I think we fished for like three hours. Everyone's spending like 20 bucks and like I won it with like 16 pounds, like three hours of fishing, Damn. a floating worm. And I mean, it, it, it was so fun. They kill it too. They kill it. It's not like a little, it is like, get this thing away from me. Like, it's like, I am murdering this worm. <laughs> it's a fun bite. So that's a little nugget. That's a little nugget. Dude, you heard it here, guys. You heard it here. Uh, and please, guys, and I like always, look in the episode mm -hmm. description everything we talked about today, including Tyler, Tyler's socials. Please go follow him on, on Instagram. Uh, he, he posts some really cool content, some really good like visuals of what, what's going on at Lake Anna. Why is it that worm works that time of year? Because the only time, mm -hmm. you don't hear people of, like dragging that in the summer or the winter. It, it, it's really mm -hmm. that spawnish window. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things where uh, they're in that territorial mood, right? It's it's a uh, it's a uh, you know I I've actually I've looked into like can fish see color so they don't see it like we think they do or how we do, and I don't know what it is about methylate. I don't even know how they see it, but something about that color. And you can throw like another, you can throw like a bubble gum one. I'm sure you probably do the same thing or like a straight black or something. But something about that methylate, man. I think it's just like a territorial kind of get that get that away from me especially if you get it near like a bed and you have a fry garter or if you have like just a post spawn fish that's kind of recovering um i don't know what it is man it just triggers them i think it's like a territorial thing huh that is interesting um is it okay if i show some photos of off your uh, instagram oh yeah for sure okay cool so I was looking at these absolute studs. And then if you guys want to see like the swim bait bite works, I mean, this one has a <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, I man. Mean, that's, that's fun. Yeah, I thought I was hung up. Like they're on, so right now, um, they're on they're on the staging bite right now. Pretty good. Um, actually the first wave this past weekend. So what we're like March 29th right now, like when we're recording. So whatever the following weekend was, uh, you actually saw that first wave. It was the first, uh, there hasn't been a wave like this yet this year. It, that first wave coming up, like a uh, like big wave, like, you know, the channel finally got a, got enough of a temperature change where they're like, oh, okay, it's that time. Because um, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't like that before. It, it wasn't. Um, we got a, a good trend, a, a really good warming trend, and you got that first wave. I still think, you know, there's some, <clears throat> there's some big girls out there in the channel that have no reason to move yet, and we need another good trend. But uh, that first wave, and I mean, when you get that first wave of fresh fish, you throw a big bait like that in front of them when they're staging. They're gonna, they're gonna crack it. What? When was the last time you were out there? Oof, uh, two days ago. Let's say okay. Wednesday. Yeah. So this past weekend, um, I know a couple, a couple of my friends just just went down there for fun, and, and they didn't have a lot of success on the lake. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was like a Saturday, Sunday when, when you had that huge weather shift. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is they had a cat tournament there and they still did pretty well at the, at the cat event on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. So what, what did you see with the weekend that could, could affect people? Was it just the cold weather? Did that push them off? So this weekend, you know, it really depends on where you, on where you fish. Cause I know where I was, I was in, uh, I was kind of all over the place, but I would say I was like in between mid and down towards the dam. Um, you know, I don't know what it is uh, that really could have had that other than if someone was fishing way up the creek and, uh, you know, the, the fish weren't really moving up like they were in that mid and, and that section down by the dam. Um, mm. Bites weren't like it wasn't like, you know, like 100 fish a day type thing. Like it was just kind of like we found something and ran with it kind of deal. Um and yeah, we, I mean, we were just fun fishing, but we had heard, we had heard too, when we were at the boat ramp and some of the guys like that, I always see there, like, yeah, it was like tough today. It was like typical Anna. I don't think they're moving up. So I think it's one of those things where there is still fish like out deep. And that's, um, that's an important thing that I, you know, I kind of wanted to highlight like water trends, like, especially if you're going there and you don't fish a lake water trend is 10 times more important than the number you see on your graph. Like, 50 to 55 in a short period of time is better than 60 to 57. You know what I mean? Like that, mm. that shoot up of temperature in a quick span can really get fish going. Even if the water on the, on the gauge is, might be cooler than if you went there, but it was 60 to 57. Um, so I think, I think if you need to look at the trends, if you're going there for a trip, and see, am I on a warming trend or am I on a cooling trend? It doesn't matter. Like when you go there and you get that first gauge, 
yeah, keep that in mind. And and at some point down the spring, the water is so stable, it really doesn't matter because if they're going to spawn and they're going to spawn. And if they're up there, they're up there, you know, they don't usually backtrack. But at this time of year, and I still think for the next two weeks, the trend is way more important than what you're seeing on your gauge. Um, you can see your gauge get real excited. And you can see like a surface temperature of like 62. I'm like, man, they're going to be on the bank. But then like you realize that, that the trend wasn't really there to, to have them moving up like that and being more aggressive. Um, so, yeah, I would say I would say that if you're going for a trip right now, next two weeks here in April, pay attention to the trend. Don't 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 get that. Don't get excited and see, you know, 60 and think they're on beds because they might be. Yeah, it might be. I, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but that trend is, in my experience on that lake and almost everywhere, way more important than what you're seeing on your gauge. That's a really good point. And I and the other thing that you highlighted, which I think a lot there would be a huge takeaway, is picking the section of lake you're gonna fish. Mm -hmm. And that not always, but it just feels like it seems like this is correct. When you're dealing with the, a lot of the fronts moving in and out in early spring, picking the 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 area of the lake near the dam, the deep clear water is gonna be more consistent for you than when you run up lake and you gamble because it is yep. a gamble that if you get a good warming trend, it can be fire. But if you don't hit it right, it's going to be an absolute slog compared to that deep, clear water. Yeah, exactly. And like that deeper, clear, more surface area water. And obviously when you have like hot water at a consistent temperature pumping into it, you're not, you're not going to see the trend. It's going to be more stable. Or if you went to that upper end and you were, you know, all the way up past the splits and stuff, that water responds to trends like, like crazy like i mean you get a cold trend that water is going to change that water is going to you're the fish are going to feel it uh, same thing with the but if you go there on like a the end of a big warming trend same thing i mean that that's probably the juice um really out at this time of year after a really big warming trend because those fish are going to feel it quicker mm, yeah that's a that's a really good point what kind of tournaments do you have coming up uh so my next one is like I think it's the Northern TBF Open on Anna um, <clears throat> on April 22nd. So, you know, really looking forward to that one. That's that's right in my wheelhouse as far as like my history on this lake. Um, and a really fun time uh, to, to fish there. Uh, I think that's a time that everyone can get kind of excited out here because really this time, and if it is anything like last year, starting around that time, that past mid to going into late April, I mean, you have pre-spawn spawn, spawn some post spawn, not a bunch, some post spawn. And sometimes really, if you get it up there, um, probably past this April 22nd deal, you'll get a shad spawn at the same time. You have like all these things going on at the same time, which, so you have a lot of opportunities to catch fish in different ways, but it can also kind of get you panicked. You know what I mean? Like you can, mm -hmm. you can try to do too much. So I would try to find some sort of rotation if you are going there in the spring and you know, it is late April or it is early May find a rotation that works for you and also what you want to do because you can fish this lake this time it is a short window but you can fish it how you how you prefer to fish um there is there i, I promise you guys there's not a secret this time of year on a lot of there's there's things that will that will definitely increase your efficiency and little things like that but don't worry about the bait too much that you're throwing you know really just worry about your your water trends and, and and adjust the lake to fish it to your strengths and you will do fine you will do fine april through may how much do you think the moon plays um it does it does but not much you know I, you always hear about that but like i think it, it's in tandem with something else like say you have a new moon or a full moon on a warming trend oh for sure for sure for sure yeah. like like that but like if you have a cold a cold trend on like a new moon or full moon you might get a few, but I don't think you're going to be like, you know what I mean? Sometimes you'll go out there and you're like, dude, every fish just moved up on the bank overnight. And then you're like, oh, it was a full moon. Oh, it's been 70 for the past four days. So like things like that, like, yeah, that can like really get them up there. But like, you know, I think it's such a combination of everything. I don't think one thing, I don't think it's an exact science on one variable. I think it's a mix of variables uh, that goes into that thing. And then some fish, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if they care. Sometimes I think the big fish do do their thing first. And sometimes I don't, um, you know, some, uh, I think time, the amount of daylight in the day is probably the most important thing on top of a, a yes. water trend temperature. I agree with that. Yeah. 
I think the more time and everything in nature responds to longer days, um, more daylight, everything does. Yeah. Like that, that to me is something that people do not talk about enough uh, is how the daylight penetration, because depending on where you are, the one thing that's always constant, whether you're in Virginia, Florida, or, or Lake Erie, is the amount of sunlight that you get per day will increase, whether the temperatures do or not. And I think that signals to Mother Nature, like, hey, listen, it's time to get going here. Yep. Yeah, I agree 100%. And it's important, too. So that could be, um, you know, I'm not a biologist. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But, you know, the the eggs that you need they need sunlight um you know they need some sort of sunlight water penetration so i think that that is like that main cue to a big female that it's okay to do this now this is like what nature's telling me to do it's a two there two get this up guys just to kind of like so you guys have an idea of what we're talking about and search perfect boom so you're looking at this for April and then, the, and then for, for Virginia specifically, what I, I feel like is when you get that first full moon in April and May, you're going to have stuff happen. I, I know down at Smith and Kerr and places like that, sometimes a full moon in March can do things, but I, I really feel like you're going to get movement on a full moon, especially as, as you get that warmer weather. So I'm betting that you're going to probably, if I was a betting man, you're looking at the first, you got the second, third, fourth. I mean, you got peak full moon on April 6th. Yeah, 6th, and you've got, you got a warming trend too, looking at the weather right now as well. So you're going to see fish on the bank, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, and then your tournament will be the next weekend, right? The 15th or the 16th? So uh, the 22nd, 22nd. The 22nd? Okay, mm -hmm. so then you're going to have a full new moon then. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's going to be like so many ways to win. You know what I mean? It's like there's so many ways you can win out there. I can, you know, I can, I'm thinking of like 10 just off the top of my head right now. So if you could, let's say just for your tournament, I was just walking through some scenarios here. If, if they start pushing and it looks like it's going to be a spawn deal, would you, mm -hmm. would you focus on betters and just mark as many as possible? Or would you ignore bed fish and go the pre or post spawn pattern? Uh, that week, um, I'm going to look for, for, for bedding fish for sure, but I'm not spending time unless it's four pounds plus, um, on a bedding fish. I'm just not, uh, the way that I want to attack that lake. I'm actually going to be probably at that time. You might have post-spawn. I don't think so. I think it's going to be more of a pre-spawn. Uh, you might have a few really? post-spawn mixed into it, but I think you're still going to have a lot of pre-spawn and a deal there on Anna that people don't really know is when you think of sight fishing, on a low, this is true on all lowland reservoirs, by the way. If you think of sight fishing, you think you're like all the way back in the creek, you're in like three foot of water, you're in this like perfect thing. On lowland reservoirs with all that fluctuation change, you can get weird shoals and weird flats with hard bottom and things like that on somewhat main lake. I'd call it like sub main lake to main lake. And they spawn on that. So you're, you're fishing for spawners, but you just aren't sight fishing them. Um, you can do that on almost any lowland reservoir. Um, on shoals and all sorts of different things. So technically I think the way I'm going to attack it is I'm going to be, unless I see something, I mean, if I see like a nine pounder on Ed, like I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going straight there. But, um, but for the most part, you know, my game plan is probably these areas that fish can spawn and fish are, are moving up pre-spawn. Uh, there are areas of that in a lot of lowland reservoirs, just because the way the lake lays out and it has islands and it has things that come up. Spawning does not necessarily mean all the way into the back of a creek um, on these reservoirs. So you think it'll still be like in a pre-spawn vibe by your tournament on April 22nd? Really? I think it's no, no, no. I'm saying there's going to be both. I'm just saying the way that oh, okay, I'm going gotcha. to attack it. Yeah, there'll be fish gotcha. spawning for sure. Okay. Right then, for sure. You're going to see a lot of guys, you know, staring in one space for, for two hours and, you know, having, having fish frustrate them. And I try to avoid that uh, if I can. Um, Why? It's just, it can be, I mean, I, I think I'm actually pretty good at sight fishing, but I don't know how efficient it would be on this lake to be like, I have five with like this tournament, it's probably like 80 boats minimum. Like I, 
someone's going to be on the other one. I'm going to be like, ah, I'm just going to get frustrated. I'm going to go to another one. Someone's going to be working that one. Or I'm going to sit on one. It's going to take an hour to buy. You know, it's like time management at the end of that. Like I, if I can avoid sight fishing, which on this lake, you, you can avoid it. You can avoid sight. You can still catch spawners. You're just not sight fishing them. Um, that's, that's just kind of how I'm going to look at it. But yeah, if there's a guy that gets in a rotation that gets five good sight fish on that, I mean, yeah, a good chance to win there. Can they do it for sure? Is it going to be hard with that many boats and how little of a lake it technically is? Yeah, to have five. I think it's something where maybe you have a sight fish or two and then you have to have something else. Yeah, I just don't. I've always had a hard time. Like, hmm. When you're dealing with that time of year on lakes where you're going to get that that push of, of spawners and you're practicing, I, I, I don't know what the right way to look at it is. Because on, on one hand, if you go out on a Friday before your tournament, let's say, mm. well, guys, this is kayak, boat, don't matter. And, and you're going down the bank and you see you got two or three good spawners. It to me is like, do you ignore them? Or do you like, okay, there is a four pounder on a bed here. Let me mm. mark this thing. And then maybe what I do is I will go blast by to see if anyone's working it or not work the fish first to see if i can get that kicker right off the bat then go to my non-spawning you know idea mm -hmm. or do you just do your your normal idea and then go back at the end of the day and see if it's there which probably if you wait till the end of the day it's probably going to be gone mm -hmm. i don't know it, it's interesting to see how you should work them in there because yeah it's just like yeah for yeah and a lot of that i mean when you're blasting off early too i mean unless you really you know, that light, we're not even going to be able to see them. So it is a weird deal, but I do agree. You kind of said something and that's something how I approach tournaments. I mean, it's, I don't like the swing for the fences thing. I mean, I get people mm -hmm. say that and sometimes they do mean it, but it's more or less just like, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, I, I'd say, I'd say you should spend more time targeting your bigger fish. You always hear like, I want to go catch five and then look for a big one. Which, yeah, in a tournament, sometimes it is, but on like a one-day tournament, why are you going to give yourself less time to go catch a big fish? Why would you do that? Yeah, yeah, you got a yeah. good point there, <clears throat> especially when you can see the size of it. Unlike anything mm -hmm. else in your game plan, you know that this one is like, okay, this is my kicker. I remember yeah. at Smith one one year, my, my brother and I were fishing a uh, Fishers of Men competition, and in practice, we saw like a six-pounder on the bed. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, she was giant on a Friday, which is good. Yeah, so this hit close to home. And then we, we kind of ignored it and we fished our little pattern. And by like 11 ish, we went over to this co and there were a ton of boats. Yeah. And my thought was like, we had a decent limit. Um, I think we finished in like the, maybe the 20, 20 ish place, but it's like, should we have spent time on that fish first? Looking back, I do believe like you're like, that's correct. It's like, if you know, there's a bigger fish, a bigger caliber fish on the bed, just knock your kicker out right away. Cause even mm -hmm. if you work that thing possibly for two or three hours, you got a six pounder in the boat, a five pounder in the boat, dude, that's going to calm you down a lot. Yeah. 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 I just, you know, it's just like a thing from on a, on a two day event and things like that, things can kind of change a, a little yeah. bit, but on a single day event, my approach has always been, you know, I'm going to spend the most time catching the bigger ones because it's harder to do. You know what I mean? I want to give myself more time to do the thing that's harder to do. Um, catching five, but sometimes you can do that. You're like, oh, I, just, I just need to go catch five. But I think you should always kind of approach it. Like, I'm going to give myself the most time to do the thing that I think is going to be the hardest to do. What are there, uh, you said you're fishing the TBF. Is that like the, for what organization is that specifically? Uh, like the Bass Federation, like region. I think I'm on okay. like a club in like region one. Yeah, I just joined it this year. Like me and a buddy that grew up fishing uh, together and stuff. We're like, let's just go do this. I'm trying to just kind of like, because I kind of took a hiatus from tournaments and I'm trying to just like slowly get in. I was like, I'm just going to, you know, do the TBF, do local stuff. And then maybe a few BFLs in the next year, just kind of build off of that. Um, so this is kind of just like just fishing that. And they're all, you know, I only met them once, but bunch of bunch of good guys and stuff and you know guys who are who have been fishing all this virginia stuff for a while and you know it, it's definitely a good good organization how was uh how was that you, you mentioned this earlier how was chickahominy oh man it was rough it took 12 pounds to win so like when you're on oh, the chick gosh. yeah when you're on the chick like it doesn't matter the caliber or tournament whether you're 
like junior youth or you're like the elite series or whatever, if it takes 12 pounds to win on the chick, it doesn't matter what level, you know, that it was just a funky day. Um, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I, <laughs> I got humbled pretty quick. We were at the first 20 minutes. I'm fishing like a three, four ounce jig. I flip it into a lay down. And I mean, like, not like, you know, like, Oh, I wonder what that was. Like we, I had like a four and a half to like five and a half fish right at the boat come off like right Dude. away like 20 minutes like would have been like at least big fish would have like been enough and then it was like i don't let it get to me i was like oh man I, we were actually like laughing like i don't know like it was like one of those things where you're like that's just fishing and oh, then man. yeah it was like a tough one but you know it is what it is just you got to take it and take it in the chin and go to the next one and uh we figured something out like that's the thing but we figured it out too late and when you do that you don't you don't do that great we figured out um, a little incoming tide bite and the fish were, uh, they weren't on hard cover that day. There was not really any grass or lily pads up yet. I mean, it just looks like a barren cold river. It doesn't look alive. So the fish were actually in the mud on incoming tide. Like, I mean, in the mud, it's a weird thing, but that's when we started getting bit, like literally incoming tide hitting feeding creeks at the mouth of them in the mud. Weird thing. How late we figured it out, started getting bit, started catching, put, put, put a couple in the live well. And then it was like, we got to run back and it's too late. You know, I just figured it out too late. What do you mean in the mud, like burrowed in there, like gophers or like on it, the, the bank? So, yeah, like weird, like catching fish with like mud on them. Like weird. Hey, okay. Like they were. And, and if you look where we were fishing, like no one would have fished there. Cause it looked terrible. Like you would have been like, that's like, you would have saw that. And like, I'm going to fish everywhere today, but right there. Cause it just looked bad. I don't, I think we were just like, almost like, Hey, we've done literally everything. And I, I cut my teeth on the Potomac. So I, I, I understand tides. I understand how, how to, how to, you know, typically run with tides and the chick it's, it's smaller so you can do it, but you gotta be fast. And, uh, I was like, man, that looks terrible. Let's go fish it. And then it was like, doink. Okay. Doink. Okay. Run to the next one. Boom. Lose one. And then that's like, we're working it down. And I mean, dude, if we just had, it's like one of the shoulda, coulda, woulda ha, give us like another hour on that. And we catch, we have five and like five in that tournament is like probably the difference between a check and not because it was fishing so tough. That's a great attitude to have. Cause it, you know, I was, um, I've been contemplating that like about how much you should fish to your strengths to, to fish the same body of water. Um, and maybe it's with all the guests that I've been interviewing lately. When you, when you get these really good and I got some great episodes, guys that are going to going to be dropping here with, with some big local legends, some local sticks. And, and they, a lot of them fish the same bodies of water for like 10, 20 years. Like how, how long do you want to be fishing a body of water before you get issues in your game? And this is what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was trying to analyze this today. If you are a baseball player or a golfer and, and you practice your swing, you can over practice your swing and create holes in it. Can that happen where if you just fish like Anna every single day nonstop, do you actually create issues because you, you don't have the ability to like separate yourself from the lake? Because look at how many people yeah. from Ohio can just show up and win on the Potomac and beat all these river rats and spend their whole life on it. And I've always been curious about that. Like, I, I don't know. It, it, yeah. it, I'm trying to figure out how you should spend your time as an angler because I feel like you can overfish a place. Yeah, yeah. History hurts. History, history hurts a ton. Um, the first place I noticed this on was the Potomac. I mean, like, it's like Potomac is almost the same story as me with Anna. Like, it just kicked my ass and, like, humbled me. And, like, sometimes you need to get your ass kicked because, like, for people like me and a lot of fishermen, uh, when you do that, when you – sometimes when you get your ass kicked enough, like, it gives you that motivation, like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna find out how to kick you back. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that initial phase is typically usually – for like that year or two, when I look back at my Potomac history, is when you do the best, is when you do the best. And then you're like, oh, I figured it out. And then you, you can get lazy. So I'm trying not to do that. Like there's stuff I know and I purposely avoid it. Like I'm like, I know I can go there and catch one, but I'm not doing it. Like I'm not doing it. It's not worth it. I know it's not worth it mentally. So on Lake Anna, I have sections that from now until that tournament, I'm not fishing. I'm not going there. I'll look at it. I'll graph it. I'm not fishing it. There's no way in hell I'm fishing it because I know on tournament day it's going to it's gonna get in my head or something and I'm not going to be able to make proper adjustments and all that. Everything that I'm fishing from now until then is all new stuff. 
if I find something new that I can incorporate into like a rotation or a little deal that I, that I know I can usually get a few bites on, that's a bonus. But if I just beat the shit out of the stuff that I'm already catching them on, what's the point of, you know, what's the point of that? I'm just burning my spots at that point, especially if I'm fishing a tournament and I'm not learning anything. So yeah. that's, that's the big thing. When, when I, um, <clears throat> I mean, and, and guys, you know, like from, from past episodes, stuff like I've had a little bit of success on the Potomac and it, it was, it was a weird moment for me, almost like a religious experience. When I came back, it's like, so I've had success on this river and I, what am I going to do now? Like at this point, do I spend the next 20 years becoming river rat? And, and what's the bell curve on my return on investment there? When in the end, I truly believe if it's your time, it's your time. It's you make a couple of good decisions and you have a couple of fish that don't come off and you win. And, and that, I'm not trying to say it's like all luck, but then it's like, so how much longer should you spend on a fishery specifically before it's like, there's not a return on your investment. And I know there are some outliers of guys that can just constantly win on it, but there are so many great river rats that I know that they, they still don't have maybe all the hardware. Or if you, yeah. if you take them off the river and you take them on a lake Anna, they, they might struggle a little bit because it, they've donated all that time there. And and to me, that's where I am mentally trying to, I'm, I'm trying to figure out my game of like, you know what, maybe I, I just, I don't focus on one place, but I just bounce around a little bit um, mm-hmm. and try to get well-developed. I, I don't know. I'm still trying to articulate it in my mind, what, what I'm thinking. No, I mean, I, I 100% agree. Like I just, if you get, you have to get to a level where you're comfortable enough before you can probably make that decision that I'm going to go do something completely different that I don't typically do. So I'm not saying like, go catch a fish on, on one spot and be like, okay, mm-hmm. like now I'm going to chalk that up. Like try to run that, try to try to advance on that to a point where you really, it's like, I don't know how much more I can do with this, but I haven't tried that in this part of the lake. So maybe like go do that. So that's kind of like how, it is there's like sections of that lake that I'm pretty much refusing to fish and it hurts because I know how to catch them there. Like I can go out there and I, I can smoke them. Like I could go out tomorrow and catch them, but I'm not going to, I'm going to go somewhere and, and make it suck. <laughs> so, so this is, this is the situation I put in my head and, and I'm going to, I'm going to move it and we'll just make it like Anna. Lake Anna, yeah. there is a, a Toyota series in let's say June. All right. And somebody's going to sponsor you. You're going to be able to, to fish this thing. Mm-hmm. are you going to then fish like you probably do let's say every sunday you're going to fish a tournament every mm-hmm. sunday you're going to fish tournaments all the way up to that or would you be like okay i got a big tournament coming up in june i'm not going to fish like Anna as much i'm going to separate myself go fish some other lakes that way when i when i get closer to the date this is like a brand new lake in my mind i'm going to fish it differently because i thought about that mm-hmm. if like there was a big tournament on the potomac i don't know if i'd fish a bunch of potomac teams and be there every weekend versus a lot of the guys that I've known, some of my friends that have driven from Ohio, they look at that place so much differently because they separate themselves for a little bit of time mm-hmm. and they make better decisions. And in my mind, it's like, yeah, I don't, I think sometimes fishing a tournament every weekend on your place hurts you when a big tournament comes because you've mm-hmm. got too much history on there. Yeah, that's no, I agree. So I'm not fishing. Um, I fish the Sunday series there at, at fish tales a lot this time of year. Um, but I've, I've held back because I know that this TBS, uh, the Northern Open there, that's uh, that's the biggest term I fished on, Anna. And if I know if I fish them, uh, you know, I'm going to, one, I'm going to go out and have success and I'm going to try to duplicate that. And that's just a boneheaded move because no mm. two days are the same. Or I'm going to get beat and it's going to beat bad and it's going to get into my head where a sense where I'm not thinking about it straight. So, I mean, yeah, I've got like the James... 40 minutes from me. I've got like Chesden, like 45, 50 minutes from me and Lake Anna that. So yeah, some of them I'm not going to do it. And if I am on um, Lake Anna, which I will be, of course, like, you know, a little bit leading up to it. Um, it's all going to be like, I think like this week and this weekend, like I'm, I'm fishing new stuff. Like, I'm not even going to let the stuff get in, get into my head and, and the stuff that I know that typically works. The stuff that I well rely on in that tournament, that knowledge, because I can't completely abandon. Yeah, um, yeah but it's all gonna be looking for for new stuff um yeah you know like i want to fish these sunday events and stuff but um, i know at the end game for this bigger tournament it's just it's not gonna do well it's not gonna do me any any good 
It's just it's I don't know, it's just an interesting way of looking at it. Um, when when you see and maybe it's because I'm now more I have a pulse on it. When you have people that fish the same place every weekend versus why is it they don't do as well? Not and again, guys. I'm saying not always versus a person that just shows up. And, and mm. like, how many times do you fish in your body of water? You're like, just screw it. I'm going to go to here because I haven't been there before versus, uh, and again, convenience, 100% get that. But like, how, how often do you try to like go fish somewhere new? I used to do it all the time. Like, I mean, all the time. Like, I mean, I still think that that, I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are like the excitement of being somewhere new and trying to figure it out is sometimes so much cooler than the place that you've been to a hundred times. Um, yes. So, so yeah, I think lately I really did kind of grind and cut my teeth on Anna and like, you know, I did make like a trip here there to like New York and do something like off the wall like that. But this year I'm like, I'm going to the Chick, going to the James, going to Cheston, going to Potomac, going to Anna. Like, I, I mean, I'll be, I'll be bouncing around a lot more this year than last year. Last year was kind of like that, like force myself to learn this place and have enough knowledge to feel confident. Man. I want to go to Cheston bad. I have not been there since I was like 12. And I hear that place is taking out some donks right now. Yeah, I've never been. And I think I'm going to try to go here in the next week or two. I've heard the same thing, but I've never been. It looks like it sets up um, kind of like a, one of the, it, it almost looks on a map like the Aquacon Reservoir. I don't know like if the depth and stuff are saying, but it kind of looks like that on a map. I just know that I think SB Fishing, I think he, he's he been there and he's had some success. And it's just such a neat mm -hmm. little reservoir. And I don't know, it, it'd just be fun and different. Yeah, um, no, yeah, I'm excited to, I'm excited to try that. That should be, that should be pretty cool. But yeah, I was seeing what you're seeing. I saw people catch some like eights and stuff and nines out of there. Yeah, and to me, that's the thing I'm trying to get to, to do more of. It's just actually like adventuring off. Like, I think I know I'm going to go to Lake Moomaw this year. I want to check that place out. And, oh, back, yeah. and back Bay. Uh, those are the two places I have got to try out because I just want to go somewhere new and explore a little bit this year. I've been to Moomaw and crazy story for that. I, wild story. But like, yeah, Moomaw's cool. Moomaw's really cool. Um Back Bay, I actually haven't been, but I've heard a lot about that. That would be a cool one to go to. Uh, you got a story about Muma? All right. I mean, yeah, I'll jump into it. So I was in college. <laughs> we were fishing. Um, what was it? I don't know what we did. We set up like a Battle of the Borders tournament between like Virginia and West Virginia. So like Nolan was there and some guys were there, like Tech, JMU. There was a few schools, West Virginia. Uh, it was in the fall. And on practice day, me and my buddy, we we roll. I can't remember the creek there. I know it's like the Jackson's, like the one below it. I don't know if we ran up the Jack. We went up there a little bit, just looking for fall fish, chasing bait. And um, I mean, like five minutes later, like this sounds crazy, but like I mean, everybody knows. Like we, there's like a police report about it and everything. Freaking gunshots, like bullets going zoof past our head, like hitting the water in front of us, like freaking. Like what you see in the movie, like a bullet hitting the water and like, what? The, what? Yeah, man, crazy, like wild, like scared the shit out of us. Like my, like we're like ducking. I'm like driving blind. Like I literally driving blind, like couldn't see, like start the boat. Like I tried to like, just, just drive like my buddy, like he's freaking out. We're losing stuff, dropping off the boat. I'm like trying to make sure everyone that in the boat is like, in the in the gunnel like down below like and, and i had to drive blind until i get like around the bend because i don't know if these guys they weren't hunting because you don't shoot like that when you're hunting you don't fire multiple rounds i don't know if they were target shooting and missing by a mile or you whatever they're doing was stupid because there's a public lake right there um but the, we could okay. see people in the far distance camping and stuff and and we ran out like had to Called police report. I don't know if they ever figured out. I think they talked to the guys and the guys were kind of like, you know, so nothing ever really came of it, but like crazy. Like, holy what? shit, dude. That's yeah. nuts. Yeah, it was the scariest like crap I ever do. Like, I'll still be on the the water today. And like it's so common around like lakes, you'll hear um just people target shooting and stuff. And it's still like it happens. And I'm do it like it still gets me all to this day when I hear like something a gunshot in the distance whether you know deer hunting turkey hunting target shooting or whatever and i'm on the water and you hear it in the distance i'm like oh don't like that you a little jumpy yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Did you catch yeah. anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, that pretty much took us out of it. Like we were just like, <laughs> like, men- like mentally, like I've never had something on the water. Like that just mentally was like, I don't even want to fish. Like, mm-hmm. I don't like, I just like, I don't like, I think, we we were like thinking about it and like me and my partner like he that he didn't want to fish and i was okay with it you know i wasn't gonna you know i wasn't in like i wasn't like yeah let's go out there again and try it again like it, after that i was like i think we just kind of went back to campus man it was it was a weird deal dude i can't top that T- tyler you know yeah thank you so much yeah. for, for coming on the show i really appreciate it uh, again guys link in the episode description everything we talked about uh, are there any sponsors, anything else you want to give a shout out to any reps? No, nothing. I mean, uh, if you're interested and want to kind of follow up on what I'm doing, just check out my Instagram, uh, TX fishing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I post, I'm pretty open about, you know, what I'm using and stuff on Anna and you can kind of watch me suck or watch me catch them. <laughs> you know, it just depends on the day. Uh, but yeah, we'll be all over Virginia this year. So it should be exciting. Yeah. And then, uh, we'll check back in guys with him after his, uh, TV up event too, to see kind of like how he's doing with his with his push uh for glory this year <laughs> and then uh thank you guys thank you again tyler so much for coming on guys please like and subscribe to the channel it really helps us out in the algorithm we are the fastest growing fishing show in the greater dv metropolitan area we'll see you next time fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.